tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. <laughs> Good evening, listener. You're listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. On tonight's program, we invite you to leave behind your safe reality and descend with us into the frightening depths of the most terrifying imaginations with audio adaptations of three rounds of frightening fiction about hideous hobbies devilish deals, and eerie invitations. I'm your host, Steve Taylor, and tonight I'll be your guide as we traverse the dimly lit corridors of your darkest dreams. Joining us tonight to help bring the frightening fiction of Nick Carlson, Wentz Hesselman, and Tasha Johnson to life are voice talents Vanessa Bonilla, Holden, and Shayna Waring. All of them past and present contestants in Chilling Tales for Dark Nights annual Evil Idol Horror Voice Acting Competitions. If you enjoy their performances tonight, visit our YouTube channel and vote on Holden's and Shayna's entries and the many others available to enjoy as we speak. And don't forget to check out the prior contestants as well, going back to 2016 via our playlists. The first round of the 2020 competition is on now. And there's plenty more to come, guaranteed to send shivers down your spine for the rest of the year and beyond. So check out our channel and join in the deliciously dark fun yet to come. Again, you can find Chilling Tales for Dark Nights in the Evil Idol competition on YouTube. Just search Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube on any search engine or visit ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and click the Evil Idol link on the navigation to see a current roster, contestant profiles, and links to all of the performances thus far. We and the candidates appreciate your support. Now, get your ticket ready. Take your seat in our theater of the minds and brace yourself. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. <laughs> Our first tale tonight was written by Nick Carlson and is performed by Vanessa Bonilla. In it, we'll be introduced to a young girl whose father has a very unusual hobby. Without further ado, I present to you The Fall. Spring and summer are daddy's favorite seasons. He loves the smell of freshly mown lawns, the stroke of sunbeams on his face, the songs of crickets at night, and the painterly bloom of plants. Matays of green studded with spots and streaks of white, pink, yellow, blue. Those warmer seasons always draw him out of the house. He breathes in the clean air, shuffling his feet through the grass, and he looks down and tells me what a wonderful time of year it is, in so many words and variations. Rebirth, reckoning, activity, he says. The perfect time to pump the life back into his creative muscles. Daddy works with bones. I don't know exactly what he does for his day job, the one that brings the bread home. Something in an office, I think. But when he has the time, he ventures out and comes back with gross things. Dead things. Animals, mostly. See this? He asks. He shows me something ragged and bloated in a trash bag. 
This was once a raccoon, he tells me. It still is, I correct. Half right, kid, says Daddy. It was a lot of things when it lived. A kit, a father or a mother, a nuisance, a pest, a rabid beast, perhaps. But now, no longer. I don't respond, but mostly because I fear if I take my hands away from my mouth, the odor will make me throw up. Daddy smiles and lugs the bag to the yard. I follow him with a strained eagerness. With Daddy's hobby, the bad parts are over with quickly. There's a hole dug in the woods out back. The pile of dirt is moist and studded with white beads. I plug my nose harder as he overturns the bag and dumps the body into the hole. Then, with calculated diligence, he shovels soil back into the hole and the awful sight and smells are swallowed by earth. Give it three weeks, and this will become something more than just dead, he says. I nod, thinking back to a special room in the basement, adorned with a veritable army of skeletons. Squirrels, possums, cats, snakes. There's even a deer in there, a young doe, its once benign black eyes now dry, empty sockets. All had been scavenged from the forest or the road, their meat cleaned off and brought back to new life as bony memorials. It's the coolest hobby a dad can have, I feel, and he even lets me in on it. Is it time? I ask him as he pats the last scoop of dirt onto the hole. He leans thoughtfully on his shovel. Hmm, I guess we can take a look now. I can barely contain my excitement as we move a few yards down to an older patch, distinguishable only by the relative lack of vegetation on it. Daddy begins digging again, more carefully this time. At a point, he's chiseling tiny licks of dirt off, as to not damage the prize resting below. Finally, he gets on his knees and sifts his fingers through the loose soil, working around the buried prize. He lifts it out of the ground. A few tiny black beetles fall down, but the thing in his hands has been nearly perfectly cleaned. I'd say it's just about ready, he says handing it to me. I'm in awe. Daddy said he wouldn't keep it for himself, since it's not a complete skeleton. But the head of a muskie is wonderful enough. One might mistake it for some prehistoric lizard. The top of its skull is a fragile framework of crannies and dents, almost arcane in their intricacy. The teeth are the showstopper, serpentine fangs for spearing fish and snagging ducklings. Of all the bones I've collected for myself, it's certainly the neatest. Remember what it was like when I first showed you? Daddy asks. It was this hideous, evil-looking thing. Half rotten and gross. But look what a few weeks in the ground did to it. A mighty big improvement, I'd say. I rotate it in my hands. It's beautiful. The rest of the year, fall and winter, doesn't bode well with Daddy. He stays inside, Hold up in his study. He gets short-tempered and snaps at me easily. I looked up what he has. It's called Seasonal Affective Disorder, aptly shortened to SAD. Something about not getting enough sunshine on your skin. Every year, I always encourage him to get outside and at least take the edge off his condition. And every year he refuses, with mean words and threatening gestures. He doesn't hit me. He's come close, though. If it weren't for him, I'd like fall and winter just as much, if not more. It's a time of rest, to reflect on the quiet moments of life. I only like spring and summer most because Daddy does. Because he's himself during those times. It's September now. I try not to think about what's coming next. The leaves will catch fire and drop. The cold breezes will barrel through and the world will become soaked in gray, and Daddy will retreat to his hole and turn mean. I hang on to what we did together, and what little we still can do. Fifth grade is a new challenge for me. Middle school feels just around the corner, and everyone around me is gearing up for the big kid years. I feel like I don't know anyone anymore. All my friends are different people inside now. They hang out with kids they never even acknowledged before talking about rumors and fashion and naughty things. 
I'm just hoping I can keep moving from one braid to the next. There's more to life than what's around at the time. Daddy's skeletons teach me that. Thankfully, it's a Saturday. I've taken a sitting out on the back deck, observing the specks of red among the green tree line. Sometimes I see individual leaves detach and flutter to the ground. It's one of those quiet moments of the changing seasons I have to enjoy in private. The gate swings open, and I see Daddy lurch into the yard. He's dragging something behind him, something heavy in another black bag. I jump to my feet, wondering if he'd brought back a mate for the lonely doe in the basement. He often comes back from his trips empty-handed, so it's always thrilling when I see he's got another one. He notices me and stops. His eyes are wild. I can see them swimming from a distance. His balding forehead glistens with sweat in the afternoon sun. He drops the load next to him and beckons me forth. As I approach, the familiar smell of roadkill hits me again, and I pinch my nostrils shut. Hello there, sweetheart, he whispers out of breath. Daddy found something incredible. He hasn't found one like it in a very long time. Despite the stink, I crane my neck to peek into the bag. Can I see? Not yet, honey, he softly chides, stepping in front of the bag. Some things are very personal to Daddy. Special, you know? Some things I have to savor for myself. Do you understand? I nod, thinking about the falling leaves. I understand, Daddy. Good. He stares off into the distance, his eyes gray as winter trees. You might want to head inside for this one, honey. If you thought the other stuff smelled bad, well... Let's just say that you're still young and innocent, and we want to keep it that way. I smile and run inside, the door shutting behind me. But I'm almost immediately up in my room, where I can spy on him from my window. The trees obscure my view. Yet I can tell whatever he has takes a very long time to bury. I catch flashes of something that appears the color of hide. He almost definitely has found a dead deer on the road. Maybe a buck, a twelve-pointer even. Wouldn't that be a sight to see? I know it would have to wait though. The beetles on the ground can only eat so fast. And with the weather getting colder, they'll slow down the more they work. If they can finish in time. I guess I'd hate fall and winter too, if that meant my hobby had to be put off due to forces I couldn't control. I think I understand Daddy a little better now. A few weeks pass. Daddy hasn't made any more trips since. He's back in his room, sulking and depressed. More leaves continue to fall. Little frozen embers upon the yellowing grass. They're the only reason Daddy comes outside this time of year, to rake. And even that's a rushed, sullen endeavor. Fifth grade continues to suck. I think I'm starting to get SAD too. The pressures of school force me to retreat into the lonely corners of my bedroom, to decompress and let those dark thoughts ooze away like sap from a tree. It's all a part of growing up, I try telling myself. It doesn't work. I love daddy, but I don't want to end up like him. There's only one way I know of to reach him. When Friday evening rolls around, I make my own venture out to Daddy's usual honey holes, the highways that surround our subdivision. I can only imagine what passing cars might imagine as they see me, on the side of the road, a lonely ten-year-old girl dragging a wagon loaded with plastic trash bags. Perhaps I'm the subject of some new age juvenile delinquent rehab program but the judgmental gazes only last a split second. They're soon gone from my sight at a speed of 55 miles per hour. It doesn't take long to find my first subject. At first, I think it might be another deer. The size and color seem bright. But as I draw closer, I see that its tail and head are wrong. It's a golden retriever, barely a year old, freshly struck, by the looks of it. Its flank and muzzle are dyed faded crimson, its ribs misplaced underneath its skin, its tongue dried and trailing from its jaws. My heart sinks. We've never owned a dog before, 
but attachment towards them is a part of being human. It's upsetting, like bile in my throat. Dogs ought to be running around their homes with their placidly serene expressions, unburdened by human imperfections. But I think of Daddy, cooped up in his room, the only grown-up in my life who's ever loved me, and my heart sinks even further. I have to do something. I have to break him from his rut, to show him that someone out there cares for him, loves him, for who he is. Only then, as I work the dog's broken corpse into my wagon, do I hate the passing car's looks. They don't understand what we have. It may seem ugly now, but what I'm doing will make it better. I'm going to make it something more. As night falls, I knock on Daddy's door to try it to get him to come out. But he's not answering me. He's whispering to himself. Something bad, I imagine. I decide not to bother him, just like he does it. I grab a shovel and lug the wagon through the backyard to the rugged spots among the trees. I find an untouched patch and begin digging. It's slow work, and despite the coolness of the night, it's enough to draw sweat from my pores. Daddy always makes it look so easy. The moon gives me ample light to see, and I think the hole's deep enough. I wheel my wagon to the edge and crouch down, using all my strength to tip it over. The body rolls out with a sickening flop, and I can immediately tell the hole's inadequate. Its stiff paws stick out the other side. Its head torques upward, staring at me with scrunched eyelids. I choke back a sob and immediately shovel dirt over its face. My arms tremble as I continue the burial and my meager pile is almost gone by the time I see it isn't going to be enough. It looks like the ground is midway through devouring the dog. My eyes, irritated by sweat, sting further with the arrival of tears. All I wanted was to show Daddy that I could tape up his mantle, to give him a little light during the dark times. The moonlight is gone. I can barely see my hands in front of my face. Downtrodden, I turn back to the house, using a lone light through a window to guide me. Something growls in the night. I halt. From all around me comes a dribbling of wetness on dry leaves. A muted cry busts through my throat, now seized up entirely. Daddy told me all about bears, what to do when one shows up. But all I can do is remain still, frozen in fear. My muscles shudder like window panes from the noise. I can't pinpoint where it's coming from, or if it's moved at all. Silence descends on me, however. It's disappeared, or it's taken to watching me. I step forward. The sound of my foot on the leaf litter is all that greets me. My hearing seems heightened, picking up the tiniest noises from the furthest lengths. I continue walking, the orange glow of the distant lamp tantalizing. If I could just get back up to the back deck. Another growl emanates, this time higher pitched, as if from a different animal. Then the darkness around me simmers with noises, rustling footsteps, snuffing breath, snapping branches, the soundtrack of predatory anger. My nerve breaks and I run, and an unearthly shriek explodes from behind me, some horrible, primeval curse, screaming despair and suffering onto me. I throw the back door open and slam it shut, and the beastly sounds outside instantly quell. I can't help the tears flowing forward freely. I should have left that dog where it was. Maybe its owners would have found it and given it a proper burial. They would have made it better than anything even Daddy could have done. I shamble upstairs to bed, uncaring towards my muddy hands and sweaty hair. Normally, I sleep with my blinds open. Not tonight. I want nothing more than to blot out whatever evil is brewing out there in the woods. The next morning, it takes Daddy a full ten minutes to notice me downstairs in the kitchen. He draws the curtains. He puts a pot of coffee on. He hastily stashes some dirty plates in the dishwasher before he turns and sees me at the table. Good morning, he says sleepily. Then, he does a double take. Whoa. Are, are you alright, sweetheart? 
You look like you haven't slept all night. As he approaches me, his nose crinkles. You smell like death. Were you outside last night? For God's sake, there's leaves in your hair. He plucks a fragment of leaf from behind my ear. I shiver from his touch. What happened? What did you do last night? Tell me! Clamminess creeps under my skin. I can't meet his face. I... I tried making bones like you do, Daddy. I... I found something yesterday, and I tried burying it like you do. He bristles in the corner of my eye. I expect him to get mad, but the mounting stillness he gives off is somehow more dreadful than an angry outburst. He sits down across the table from me. Did you see them? I finally turn to look at him. His face is worried, yet lit with something like anticipation. Unusual for him this time of year. See what? I ask, trying to sound innocent. Don't lie to me, he says. I know little girls lie, but you can't hide something like this from me. No, you probably heard them, it being so dark out. You partook in the beautification. Now you'll be able to perceive them. Perceive what? I ask. I don't want you staying outside, sweetheart, he responds. He circles around the table, genuflecting and wrapping me in a hug. Now that the leaves are fallen, you won't find peace outside anymore, he whispers. Now that the leaves are falling, you won't find peace outside anymore, he whispers. At least, not until the leaves come back. You stay inside with me. You and I will share in our oppression. Maybe we'll help each other out. Maybe it won't have to be so gloomy and gray. He delivers a quick peck on my forehead. My heart overturns with confused emotions. Elation that Daddy seems to have found that spark again. But in the face of something beyond either of us. Something terrible out there in the woods. Whatever they were, they scared me last night, Daddy. I lean my head into his shoulder. What's out there? Please tell me. He hesitates. I can feel his pulse jumping through his neck. Ugly things, he finally says. Things that ought to let go. That are unappreciative and bitter. Just remember, above all else, you and I were trying to make them better. I nod. I'll remember, Daddy. I get one more hug from him before he pulls away and starts preparing breakfast for us. I'm glad he's back, despite what I had to go through. Whatever's out there, we can withstand it, together. I know it. I heed to Daddy's word and stick around inside with him. He stays in his room still, but he lets me in and we talk. Talk about school and life and worries and woes. He only goes outside to retrieve the raccoon he buried what felt like way too long ago, and presumably finish the job I had botched myself. I ask him when his special project will be ready. He tells me in time. In art class, over the next few weeks, we learn about Roman architecture. Of all the statues and sculptures we see, one catches my eye especially so. It's the Fountain of the Four Rivers, a towering obelisk centered through a marble menagerie of coral, birds, horses, and the outreaching figures of water gods. It almost reminds me of a layer cake, the men situated out and above, superior to the animal life below them. I don't know why it speaks to me over the other architecture we've seen, but I love it. The bus ride home is the only time I can enjoy the changing seasons. The leaves have almost dropped entirely, leaving the trees colorless and naked. The nippy weather is a welcome jolt from the summer heat. I sigh as the tree line zooms past, hoping that whatever troubles have descended upon us will pass. I want to stay outside and savor it. I get off the bus outside my house and head for the front door. The driveway is empty. Daddy hasn't returned from work. 
As I approach, I can't help but notice the side gate is open. Swinging slowly in the wind, I hesitate. None of us have used that gate in months. And Daddy's always getting on me about keeping it shut. Someone else had to have opened it. Regardless, I rush over to latch it again. The barren woods out back call to me. It's my first opportunity to see the trees up close, to smell them, to feel the fallen leaves crunch under my feet. Daddy's not due back home for another hour. It can't hurt to just take a little peek. I shuffle my shoes through the leaves, stopping at the edge of the woods. I love how I can look up and see the branches twisting and spiraling together. A quiet, artistic elegance to them. I can almost see shapes in them. If I concentrate hard enough, I can trace them with my eyes. Circles, and triangles, and squares, and... Eyes. Eyes that seem to glow as the afternoon sun passes through them. There are... Hands, and spines, and ribs. There's the entire body of a massive skeletal dog swirling upward into the canopy glaring down at me with those sunlit eyes. I feel like I'm sinking into the ground. There are others too. Snakes, rats, crows. Surrounding them, flailing in motionless agony. A mass grave of bones in the trees, and carrying above them all, like huge, deathly spires, are the arboreal skeletons of people. I can see the rage in their faces. I can see their wooden limbs tapering down to grab me, their worn teeth gnashing together, their rib cages stretching with bated breath, ferocious excitement, eager to rain down their wrath. The growling wells up again. It's not from some invisible nocturnal carnivore. It's the trees themselves. And the growling is joined by vengeful whispers, high-pitched and breathy laced with venom. You too? Our blood on his hands. We've been raped, desecrated, avenge us, or betray us. We'll take you, regardless. The sunlight shifts. All of them are looking at me now. The wind picks up, and their spiny fingers flex with throttling motions. I can't find the urge to run. Instead, I whimper and retreat to the back deck, my body shaking as if bombarded by bats from within. Safely inside my house, I slump to the floor, the shadows inching across my curled body. Daddy doesn't get sad. He hears the voices. Constantly. They wake up when the leaves fall and show themselves into trees to haunt him. They can't get him if he's inside, but they can speak to him, tempt him, threaten him, torment him. And now, I'm sharing his curse. I can still hear the whispers by the time he pulls up in the driveway. He walks through the door and sees me cowered before him. His silence tells me that he knows. I'm sorry, Daddy, I murmur, rising to my feet. I, I went outside, and I saw them, and they saw me. I'm so sorry. I told you not to linger outside, he reprimands. I nod furiously. I know, I know. I'm so sorry, really, I am. What do I do now? What do you do? He sighs. I get past it, and I don't even think about stepping in their presence and provoking them. He shakes his head, striding briskly past me. Now you're going to have to do the same. No, I cry. I don't want to hear them. I want them to go away. Then get out. He snaps back towards me, his face contorted with anger. Leave this place if you think you're too weak to deal with it. You chose to accept the repercussions of my undertaking. Now it's time to grow up and own them. He leaves me hurt and despondent in the kitchen. As his heavy footfall fades away, the whispers sneak back in. For the rest of the night, he shuts himself in his room. I do the same, 
my pillow clamped over my head to block the voices. They swear at me. They make promises. They tell secrets about the pains of the afterlife. I don't understand most of it, but they get into my head and gnaw at my brain like ravening wolves. A peek out my blinds renders the trees into a scrambled pile of bony death, just like the fountain of the four rivers. They beckon me and leer with their hungry stares. I can't imagine how I'll be able to endure. I'm just a little girl. It's midnight when he throws my bedroom door open. I'm still awake, my eyes cried dry, huddled underneath my sheets. Come with me, he says. I slip out of bed, my legs freezing from the night air. Now, he growls. I pick up my pace and trail him guiltily as he leads me downstairs. No moonbeams break through the windows, but I can follow his imposing physique through the hallway and to the door leading down to the basement. The stairway down is even colder. I can barely keep my legs from collapsing underneath me. My lungs feel like ice, my beating heart a jagged chunk of ice. But the creaking steps behind me force me to finish the descent. Daddy flips on the light, and I'm blinded by the blazing bulb overhead. Blinking my vision back, I can see all the animal skeletons, mounted in natural lifelike poses, very much unlike what I saw in the branches. I can still hear the whispers, like television static from upstairs. You remember what I said about making things better, he says, walking out in front of me, admiring his skeletons. I nod too cold and scared to speak. Death is horrible and cruel, he continues. It robs the living of the very things they hold closest to themselves. And it's almost never pretty. He takes a deep breath. Those TV shows you watch, with the dramatic music and the soft light, the last words and the peaceful expressions. Lies. All lies. I'm so happy for you, honey. So happy you didn't have to watch your mother die. Her final moments with me were ugly. She looked so much like you. Except, yellow in the face, eyes red, convulsing like a goddamn worm, and spitting up foam while her jaw locked shut. She died in pain, mentally incapable of processing the consequences of her passing. I tried telling her I loved her. But she didn't hear me, and she dragged our happiness down with her, to wherever the dead go to fester. Daddy turns to me, his eyes watery too. But no matter who we are, there is beauty within. Our bones, they're marvels of design, and I, with my shovel and my yard, can turn the ugliest, most fucked up scrapings of roadkill into... Perfection. That's why I do what I do, to remind myself that death isn't all bad, and maybe, just maybe, to bring back the love that I once held. He paces in a slow circle. As horrible as it is, I silently urge him to keep talking. Better him than the ghosts outside. The voices didn't start until I had moved beyond animals. Stronger souls could manifest more clearly and further amplify the beasts, and they only got worse with each new addition. But in time, I know all that won't matter. He kneels down and digs his fingers into the floor. A hidden panel suddenly lifts up. He gestures inside it. Because it'll all be worth it. Against my will, my feet carry me over to him. I've already guessed what could be inside the hatch. But the sight of them almost makes me throw up again. Three human skeletons, packed underneath the floor like sardines, their bones jointed with screws and bolts and glue. Do you know what these men were? He asked slowly. They were vagrants. Lost. Sad. Sorry folks without a hope or dream left in their minds. They died wallowing in their own filth. Barely enough left in them to muster one last lick of regret. 
Now look at them. I cleaned away their ugly shells and put them back together. Now they're shiny and ivory and pure. And my special project. You'll appreciate this. I found a woman. A young woman dumped in the gutter. A bullet hole in her guts. Probably a sex worker by her attire. I, I'm sorry, honey. Do you know what a sex worker is? My lip quivers. All his words are like ceaseless blows to my skull. Anyway, he continues. In life, she was a nasty person, selling her precious assets to the highest bidder. But she's in the ground now, the meat of her sins decaying away. And when she comes out, she will be the beautiful woman she was meant to be. For me. And for you. He looks down at me with something like affection. You'll know, for the first time, the feeling of a mother's love. No, I shake my head. No, not like this. Honey, I'll never love another woman's face again he says, but this way, we can all remember what your mother was like, without the imperfections. Not like this, I protest. This, they, they need to be given proper burials. They need to be given respect. They're out there trapped in our trees with nowhere to go because you ruined them. Fresh tears sprout in my eyes as I back away from the hatch. I can't believe I thought this was beautiful, that I thought what we were doing was good. Daddy's face falls. He stands, wearing a mask of disappointment. You know what? I can't believe you found it beautiful, too. I should have guessed. You're too young. Too ungrateful. The corner of his lip twitches. His gaze turns narrow and shrewd. You know the thing about these skeletons? They don't gripe. And they don't talk back. They know their place. Not like those sour spirits outside. Not like you. My eyes widen. No, Daddy, I didn't mean- I don't want you to share my misery, little girl. He advances towards me. I never wanted you to. You'd never understand. And now those voices have filled your head with lies. I can only think of one way to curb their manipulation. And still keep you around as my little girl. I turn and flee. The cold air around me is an afterthought. The indignant blood in my veins sets my muscles ablaze and I power forward, the fastest I've ever gone, mindless and quick. I know it's not enough. Daddy's behind me. He's not even trying. He's taking looping, casual strides, keeping me in his sights. I'm not in trouble in his eyes. I'm just confused. And he wants to make things right with me. The moon has re-emerged outside. It casts its twisted shadow across the walls, reaching for me as I turn corners. The house is a maze with no escape. The hallways are endless circles. Any room is a dead end. There's only one place left to go. I barely manage to unlock the back door and burst out onto the deck before he can catch up. Shafts of lunar blue illuminate the backyard and my misty breath as I dash across the grass. Daddy curses at me. It detonates in the night and echoes like a gunshot, setting off dogs down the street. I emit a choked cry in response, scrambling for the tree line. The whispers have returned. They're egging me on, wishing me to go deeper, parched from blood. Daddy can hear them too. He stops halfway across the yard, his moonlit face flicking up and down. Little girl, he rasps, get your ass back here. No. I take a step back. The whispers and growling become excited. I steal a glance up. Their eyes are the color of moonlight now, their limbs a hellish black. You get over here. His tone is calmer now. You don't want to stray into their grasp. They'll violate you. They, they won't hurt me. They know I'm not guilty. I know that's a lie, even as I take a step back. Their words are all too clear to me. Come here, child. Let me indulge. Flesh and blood of the bastard man. So young. 
Daddy moves forward. Please don't do this. I love you. I'll always love you, no matter what. I clap my hands to my ears, to block him out, to block out the ghosts. I'm not listening. You will listen. Daddy spits through gritted teeth. You will listen to me, goddammit. I turn and sprint full force into the woods. The whispers turn to screams and thorns tear and scrape me, tangling in my bare skin. No! Daddy bellows behind me and gives chase. The forest around me roars and creaks, and in the moonlight I see a cascade of branches rain down and snag Daddy's clothes. He yells and swipes at them, breaking twigs and ripping bark. But they're lifting him up, and for a moment... He suspended in the air like a pallid, ragged phantom. Skulls and teeth descend upon him in the canopy, twisting his body, crunching bones raining down fat droplets of blood. His final screen is cut off as branches drive through his flesh, stringing him up in the treetops. Clouds pass in front of the moon, and the activity above ceases. Even in the low light, I can make out his head lolling to the side, a twig running through his neck and out his mouth. I finally fall to the ground, sobbing openly, not caring about the dirt or the blood or the cold. I can sense ghostly eyes watching me with wicked grins, but I have a feeling they won't hurt me for the rest of the night. They resort to silent taunts, lobbing them at me until I succumb to sleep for good. Morning is just as cold as midnight, but it brings about an electric sense of wakefulness within me. My hair is a knotted mess of filth. I'm covered with a dried layer of mud. My wounds underneath burn with reckless intent. Shivering, I stand shakily and look up to where Daddy was. He's joined in the treetops by burly black vultures, their undulating necks reaching forth and digging into his body. I sniffle. I remember that vultures eat bones off a carcass, too. There will be no memorializing him after they're through. The voices are still there, like an itch or an ache. Present, but able to be ignored. Regardless, I think it's time to do something about them the right thing. I limp back to the house, grabbing the shovel and dragging it behind me to the basement. I don't know if putting them back will make a difference, but I have to try to do the opposite of what Daddy did. I'll make them beautiful again. And now, a word from our sponsor, Hulu, and the brand new series, Hellstrom, streaming now, just in time for Halloween. A mature, suspenseful, mysterious, scary, dark, thrilling, chilling, authentic, dark and dry humor, edgy, action-packed series. Marvel Television produced Hellstrom, which is based on characters from Marvel Comics. But this is a darker, more chilling, and supernatural side of the MCU. Hellstrom is essentially the story of a very complicated family. Every family has its demons, but not like the Hellstrom family. And the world isn't ready for a Hellstrom family reunion. It's all jump-started when a brother and sister with a complicated relationship have to come together to save their mother. Definitely not a typical superhero series, Hellstrom on Hulu leans more into the horror realm, which we here at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights mind not at all. And season one consists of 10 one-hour episodes, which you can binge all at once. And something else you should know? This is not the story of kids discovering their powers. These are adults who have grown up apart and now have to learn how to deal with the emotional baggage they've accumulated throughout the years. Starring Tom Austin, Sidney Lemon, Elizabeth Marvel, Robert Wisdom, Ariana Guerra, June Carroll, and Elaine Uwe. The Hulu original series, Hellstrom. All episodes are streaming now, only on Hulu. Thanks for checking out our sponsors. We and they 
really appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed The Fall, as written by Nick Carlson and voiced by Vanessa Bonilla. Up next, we've got a second sinister story for you, written by author Wince Hesselman and performed by Evil Idol 2020 contestant number six, Holden. In it, we'll meet a gentleman whose loved one has been ensnared by the cold embrace of a terminal illness, and it seems it's only a matter of time before the icy fingers of death come to claim her. That is, until he stumbles upon something that can change everything. Without further ado, I present to you The Courtesan's Blade. I never quite figured out who decides which lost souls have a right to be remembered and which ones don't. I got a phone call while I was sitting next to my dying wife. I know that the medical equipment was supposed to be keeping her life from wicking away, but damn it. When you sit next to someone's hospital bed and you see the tubes going all kinds of places that make you cringe, all I could see was something that I saw when I was a kid. I was outside, chasing a moth, trying to catch it with a jar. I accidentally chased it into a spider's web, and the spider got to it before I did. I didn't know much about how the world worked. I came back later to see if the moth was okay, and if the spider had let it go. The moth's wings were splayed out every which way, and it could have been mistaken for being stone dead if it wasn't for the occasional twitch of a leg or a vibration in one of the wings. The only thing that was truly motionless was the spider. The fangs buried into the moth's body, eight eyes black as death, eight legs solid as the submerged part of a tomb. That's how I felt looking at my wife. Once in a while, a finger might twitch, the chin might wag, the eyelids might roll with REM sleep, but the equipment seemed to be like that spider. The real killer was cancer, I knew that. The real survivor was my wife. Most people that were treated this long weren't alive anymore. I thought that any day I came in to see her that I'd find a big chemical burn on the sheets instead of a body. Looking at the shallow veins in her bald, transparent skin, I wondered how anyone could be so full of caustic poisons and still be alive. I sat with sloped shoulders bent forward. I felt like I was going to enter a chemically induced stupor of my own. I also felt like I was going to pee myself when my phone rang. It was an assignment, a pretty messy crime scene off of Division Street near downtown. I was so close to telling the chief where to shove his assignments. The dead didn't need me near as much as the dying, but cancer is expensive, so I justified leaving my wife's side by reasoning that I would be helping her by financing her. An old excuse for a new scenario. Just as soon as I stepped out of my car, one of the blue uniforms came over to grab me. Alden! I, I mean, Detective Voiles! Come on, Mike. Nobody cares about protocol at a time like this. Especially me. He nodded. The Vic is over here. He guided me through the cop car disco strobe nightmare to a spot where blonde hair, long legs, high heels, and a short black skirt were bulleted by the flashing lights, as if a pole dancer had just passed out on the job. A hooker was assaulted and left for dead. No identification. Whatever she had in the way of a purse and stuff, it's all gone. Great. Any other kind of woman and it would have been a simple matter of finding the husband or the side dick. With a dead hooker, counting suspects is like cataloging cow farts in Nebraska. I got some gloves from the corner and began looking her over. She couldn't have been playing her trade very long. No lines on her face and... No scabs or other souvenirs from the substance abuse required to cope with the reality of being the underworld's chew toy. She didn't even have any tattoos. Oh, wait. There. One on her upper thigh. It looked like a knife and an axe crossing handles, rendered by a five-year-old. Which meant it was probably done in college. But in the detail-blurring light show, she couldn't have been old enough to be in college. There were two dark lines around her neck. One was a black choker-style necklace, and the other was a knife wound. The words 
pretty kill were carved into the flesh above her breastbone. I looked around. I knew this area of town well. When I was done doing my good deeds for the day, I was hitting the bars with the rest of the damned. There wasn't a decent drinking hole around here for blocks, so she wasn't dispensing her services in a tavern bathroom. It was mostly storage sheds and abandoned lots with few places for any real privacy with a john, unless she was banging them in the old church directly behind me. That was actually the building she was closest to. I looked up at the old institution, the stained glass washed in alternating blasts of red and blue. Churches are spooky if you look at them long enough. This kind of lighting drives that home. I've dealt with my share of bad apples, knotheads, and bad seeds, but I really didn't know anyone with enough brass to do their whoring out of a church. And maybe that's not what she was even up to. Maybe she was on her way to her hot spot and got mugged. I grimaced at the idea that I had been torn away from my wife's side just to stare at this nameless and mutilated shell that seemed like a one-way ticket to where all the unsolved cases go. I photographed the tattoo, and her remarkably unblemished face. I would start asking questions soon. I checked in with the coroner, tipped my hat to Mike, and went back to my wife's side, where beeping lights kept track of her pulse, machines did their best to be surrogate organs for the failing originals, and her eyelashes fluttered with whispers of deep, dark dreams. I stood over her for a long while, and eyed the three or four frame pictures that stood up on the table next to her bed. I wanted them to be the first thing she saw when she woke up. My phone rang and tore me out of a dream I was having while snoozing sitting up. Hold in here. Mike was on the other end, breathless. Oh, Jesus Christ, Hal. You're not going to believe this. I've always believed you before. Come on. Out with it. We found the John that murdered the hooker. Pretty kill, remember? Of course I remember. Get him ready for questioning. We, we won't be able to do that. I arrived at the station to find the worst mutilation of a human body I had ever seen in my time on the force. The John was in an alley, pinned to the wall. I'm not exaggerating. A railroad spike had been rammed into his mouth and anchored him to the back of the brick wall behind him. He was missing the arms and legs that could help him out of his situation, and streaks of blood ran straight down the wall to the ground near him. A sign hung around his neck, saying, Pretty kill. Think all that was bad? I walked back and forth, asking Mike more questions until I noticed the body's eyes were open and moving. They were tracking me. I had to pace several more times before I could believe it, but they followed me, never blinking. The eyes, I stated in disbelief. Mike nodded, but wouldn't look up at the body. He probably bled out in the middle of the night. And he's still alive. He wouldn't answer me. His brain had decided to shut down and deny any and all information that was coming in through his five senses, or else he might break. My sanity should have been splintering like Mike's, but with everything that was happening with my wife, this wasn't really reaching me. But I did decide that I was going to procure some chemically assisted decompression before the day was over. I turned to leave when I felt something roll under my shoe, too big to be your standard piece of gravel. I stooped to find a gold chain that held a pendant that was like black glass, possibly obsidian. There was a faint cherry red light coming from inside the center and it flickered like an ember that had been suspended and preserved like an insect in amber. That's when the polarity of everything that day changed. I looked around to make sure nobody would miss the dropped bauble before pocketing it and scooting. I sat with my wife long after the sun sank, got out my wallet, and looked at the wadded up twenties decided it was time. I had the bartender line up three shots of something amber and strong. Come to Papa. The first shot felt so damn good. Nice and toasty, I muttered to myself as I reached for another. My senses were assaulted by something, a cloud of vapor that reeked of cotton candy and was thick enough to be the ghost of a jellyfish. The stool next to me was suddenly occupied. She was the identical twin to the hooker that turned up. My eyes looked her up and down, emboldened by the liquor. The skirt didn't even try to hide that tattoo on her thigh. Yes, that tattoo. She wasn't looking at me. If she was trying to get my attention, she was doing a damn good job of playing oblivious. 
I became still as a statue. I listened, I looked. I was as attentive to the seat next to me as a statue could be. She swiveled around and watched the thickening crowd. Someone nearly collided with her thighs and offered a pardon me. I didn't dare touch the rest of my shots. Now that she showed up, I would need my faculties. As she downed her own share of liquor, she began posturing herself on the stool in ways that made it clear what she was there for, puffing clouds of cotton candy vapor in the air. The hours rolled on, the band's playlist finished, the bodies thinned out, and she didn't win any business. So, she got up. Three, two, one. So, how do you chop off a guy's arms and legs without killing him? I said. She looked like she hit a brick wall. She turned around as if she doubted what her own ears were hearing and looked right at me. I looked right back. The silence told me that I was now in a standoff. Partaking of the liquid courage made me go first. I thought he was dead. Really, I did. And you know what? He should be dead. But he isn't. Just like you. Another stretch of staring followed. Then she simply left. I followed her. Following people home is a crime, she said over her shoulder. So is killing, I said, hiding the tremble in my voice under the sedation of the bourbon. Your legal situation gets ten times more interesting when you compound murder with dismemberment and mutilation. Her pace quickened. Maybe they'll let you off easy since you did the deed after you died. Coming back from the dead to deliver payback to your own killer has no legal precedent that I'm aware of. Definitely has been tried in court in my time on the job, so I'd say you're looking pretty good. She was walking as fast as she could without running. Also, I guess it really isn't murder if the victim hasn't quite died yet. Please leave me alone. I reached into my pocket and held the obsidian pendant. She came to a screeching halt. I could imagine the look she was wearing even though all I could see was the back of her head. You feel that? You dropped it in your haste to deal out damnation. Her tone flipped like a referee's silver dollar. I need that back, please. Show me how you put the Grim Reaper on a leash and we'll call it even. She turned to me, flushed. Give it back or I'll take it from you. I shook my head. We both know you can't do that until I willingly hand it over. Now listen, my wife is being treated for cancer. Anything that can keep a man from bleeding to death out of four gaping wounds can probably help my wife. I could see the conflict bouncing around in her eyes. I'm just looking out for my wife. You could help me out, and I'll not only give you back your little token from your personal Jesus, I'll see to it that nobody in uniform ever comes looking for you again. She looked me over for a long time. If you're lying, you'll have it worse than the man that attacked me. I'm an honest cop, I said as I held up my hands, deliberately dangling the pendant from my thumb. She led me back to where she was killed and approached the dark shape of the church that loomed over the block. Hmm. An undying hooker that camps out in a church. The place wasn't completely dark. Trembling rays came from the sanctuary. Candles were lit and they picked out a peculiar scene of pews rearranged in a circle, as if to facilitate a campfire meeting. The candles, dozens of them, were in a smaller circle inside the pews. Just like something out of a pulp horror novel I would have devoured when I was a kid, there was some sort of symbol painted on the floor inside the ring of candles and wide, sloppy strokes. I could feel the air moving, being pulled into the symbol like an airlock. I got married in this church, I said. She scratched a corner of her lips before picking up a tall candle and lighting it with another. Follow me, she said. I'd never been to the catacombs in Rome, but that night I got a pretty good idea of what they looked like. I wasn't lying about getting married in that church. I just didn't remember anyone ever saying there was a bone vault underneath the place. We stopped in front of an imposing granite door covered in carvings that were anything but Christian. It's been a minute since I picked up anything from National Geographic, but I think I could pick out a few things that were Sumerian and Egyptian. There were other things that I don't think were even hinted at in any history book. Before the door was an ugly little bull, clutched from underneath by some sort of dog-like dragon demon. A small brass knife lay in the bowl. 
Before I show you inside, you must make a blood oath to the vault. To the vault? Yes. To you? No. You know a lot about the Red King for someone who isn't his thrall. Family tragedy will drive a man to research some very interesting things if he thinks they'll yield solutions. She sliced my thumb with a knife and had me bleed into this ugly little bowl and say a few vows. And then I was led down to the bowels of the church. At first, there was the usual basement stuff, coffee cans full of nails and pews that were meant to be repaired but never were. But the air got more dense and dank, and niches appeared on the walls carved from limestone where human skeletons were posed with folded hands. And then the niches themselves were crafted from bones, femurs bound together like planks, supporting coffins and exposed corpses in burial shrouds of moss and lichens. The journey terminated at a crude stone altar that was supported by a jagged mass of rust that may have been a knife at one point in time. What is this? I was stabbed with this when I was 19. The men that didn't own the place before it was a church. Her voice became strained. They wanted a toy that would stay young forever. And they chose me. I outlived them all. I've been exactly the same as the day they cut me with it. She set her candle down next to the blade and squatted down, resting on her heels. I've made friends over the centuries. I tried to save some of them in their final hours so I wouldn't be alone forever, watching people I love die. I found out the hard way that the knife doesn't heal. It only arrests time for you. What you are when you're cut is what you get, I grunted. She nodded. The John that assaulted you is going to be a limbless vegetable until the end of time. He's no vegetable. I cut him when he was in the worst pain I could give him. She stood up and began pacing, all the while her hands unconsciously hooked inward as if to crush a skull. I brought him to the brink of death where his pain should have pushed him over the edge and then froze him there. My eyes fell to the terrific, horrific artifact. So if my wife receives a cut now, she'll be a comatose nest of cancer forever. She nodded, then raised her head to me, the candle glinting in her eye on the side of her face catching all the light. She took the ugly shank of rust and held it out to me. The next morning, I wasted no time in finding the next ingredient for my hocus pocus. The doctor came in to tell me that it was just a matter of time before she passed on, so I guessed that I had less than a day to do what I had to do. I got a mason jar from home and paid a visit to my wife's peonies in the backyard. They were an open freeway of bug traffic. Yellow jackets as bright as lemonade were the thickest. I nabbed a big one with a jar, and I looked at it as it pawed the glass and seemed to glare back at me. Job done. All I had to do was work some magic. The doctor eyed me as he picked up the clipboard off the foot of my wife's bed. So I should just let her die in her sleep without a final talk? Both of us cast a sidelong glance to the vial of stimulant on a tray next to her IV drip. Then we looked at each other. If you wake her up, she'll be in agony. You know? Everywhere cancer grows, it's taken up space that it wasn't allotted to have. So everything around it is pinched, pressed, pulled. I get it, Doc, I get it. If I wake her up, it'd better be to tell her that we found a miracle cure, or to tell her goodbye. He nodded and shuffled out of the room. I looked at the IV drip, like an hourglass of liquid or fluid. There was a port in the IV tubing that put the question to me. Let her slip away peacefully, or pull her across the coals just long enough to say whatever we have to say to each other. I scanned the pictures I had set up. I glanced down at her. For all I knew, she was in a dream where she was talking to the people in those pictures, sitting on the porch swing with a tall glass of something cold, the condensation sweating a trickle onto her thigh, unaware of the departure she was slipping into. Or maybe the avatars of those memories were seeing her off. Do you dream about dying when you're in a coma and about to die? I didn't know. I was wavering. I was lining and relining the pictures up to an imaginary line and forming them in a semicircle so they would all be facing her straight on. I tightened my lips and walked over to the port on the IV. I unscrewed the vial and screwed it onto the port. 
gave it a couple of flicks. The amber liquid began to enter the line. It worked faster than I thought it would. The body on the bed convulsed silently as if there was a cough working its way up, but couldn't quite be released. Her chest rose up as if it tried to get out of bed before the rest of her. The sound of her breath being drawn in came as a bark as the air had to push down through the swollen tissue lining her throat and her bronchial tubes. She labored so, so hard just to breathe. It was a chore to draw air in. It was a chore to push the air out. Her eyes were cloudy and like sea green stained glass. They rolled around until they fell upon me. Her breathing calmed, but it was still an agonizing task. A sparkle of comfort? Relief? Something settled into those eyes. Something was resisting it, but I could tell she was happy to see me. With superhuman effort, she tried to talk in a rasping whisper that sounded like demonic death. Alden. The word was both a greeting and a statement. Lynn, honey, the doctor told me you'd be hurting pretty bad if I woke you up, but... But I, uh... I just had to say goodbye, you know? Tears put some of the shine back in her eyes. Those irises shone like mermaid scales, the way they did when we were kids in high school. A wheeze announced that she was starting to cry. Alden, thank you. This is what I had hoped I could see. Before... Before I'm done. I know there were some others you would have liked to have seen with your own eyes. I brought the best pictures I could find. I gestured to the row of popped up and framed pictures beside her. A fat tear rolled down her cheek as she craned her neck to look at them, one by one. It was when she came to the last picture that the tear halted its descent as the weeper's face iced over with something entirely new. Her eyes were locked on the photo, as if she were making a conscious effort to not look at me. She fell silent, which could only mean she was holding her breath. It's a pretty good picture of him, don't you think? I can see why you'd bang him behind my back. He looks pretty good, even without a smile. Of course, when I took that picture, he wasn't going to be smiling at anyone. Ever again. Not you, not me, not the coroner. Oh, wait. The coroner doesn't know about him yet. I chuckled a hearty throat chuckle when her eyes finally shifted to me. What did he offer you? Was all of it beneath his belt? Money? Something money could buy? She mouthed my name, but no sound came out. You did a pretty good job of never calling out his name, but you never gave me enough action to properly have the chance to tell on yourself like that. Nothing like cancer to make a side beast get scarce, huh? He didn't look the type to be in it for the long haul. It's okay, babe. I took it a step further and made sure that he wasn't. And that's when the real tears started. She rocked her head back and forth on the pillow. No, 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 no. I can't tell if you're sorry for insulting my intelligence like this, or if you're sorry that you got caught. She made the effort to draw enough breath to spit on me. Well then, you can't judge me. Only God Almighty can judge me and I'll soon be next to him and a million miles away from you. I took out the jar with the yellow jacket and held it up. Meet Claire, I said, and I gave the jar a good enough shake that little Claire ricocheted off the glass like a cartoon bullet and got good and pissed off. I unscrewed the lid and placed the mouth of the jar over my wife's heart. Or where one would be if she actually had one. Claire didn't disappoint. My wife let out a scream that sounded more like a painful fart. Her already constricted airways locked up completely, not another breath was getting in or out. And she had the nerve to look betrayed. She hammered the call button. I reached down and held up an unplugged cable. She turned a shade of purple I never saw on her before. I didn't think people could do that while they were still alive. That bald head of hers waggling around as the panic set in. I had to cover my mouth. I reached into the pocket of my jacket and produced a certain little rusty blade and thrust it into my wife's neck. Blood flowed, but wouldn't drip. The sheets my wife laid on remained untouched. The knife drank deep. I leaned in close to my wife's ear. A little something to remember me by. 
millennia after I'm dead. You're going to have time to think about what you've done. She began a convulsion that looked like headbanging. I held a smile from the moment I stepped into the hallway to when I walked out onto the traffic-ridden street. Did I feel guilty? Nah. She didn't. Why should I? I headed for the church to return the knife. Maybe after this world crumbled into the earth, falling into the mire of its own sewers, the two of them could keep each other company. The hooker telling my wife what a smooth talker I am, and Lynn literally nodding in agreement to everything she hears. And now, a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. I've got a straight-up question for you. Do you have issues with grief, or sleeping, or self-esteem, or stress, anger, whatever it might be that may be bothering you? One of the sure things that always helps is speaking to someone about that. And that's why I want to talk to you about BetterHelp. If you're having trouble with sleeping, it may stem from depression, it may stem from other issues going on in your life. Maybe your brain won't shut down because you have so much going on, you just can't sort it all out. That's where BetterHelp can help you better. BetterHelp's not self-help. It's professional counseling that you can connect with in a safe and private online environment on your own time. And these counselors are available for you anytime. You'll always get responses rapidly from your counselor, matched specifically to you and available to clients worldwide. And what may be better for you with BetterHelp, anything you share is confidential. BetterHelp is the better way to access licensed professional counselors. It's convenient, professional, and affordable. And recently, so many people have been using BetterHelp, the company's been recruiting additional counselors in all 50 states. I want you to start living a happier life today as a listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting betterhelp.com slash chilling. Join over 1 million people taking charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash chilling. Thanks for taking the time to visit our sponsor. We and they appreciate it very much. I hope you enjoyed The Courtesan's Blade, as written by Wentz Hesselman and voiced by Evil Idol 2020 contestant number six, Holden. Up next, we've got a third and final tale of terror for you, written by author Tasha Johnson and performed by Evil Idol 2020 contestant number eight, Shayna Waring. In it, we'll dive headlong into the story of a young woman who receives an offer she can refuse and absolutely should if she knows what's good for her. Without further ado, I present to you, Let Us In. If the children come knocking at your door and ask to enter, you must never invite them in or they'll devour your soul. Is that what she screams about? I ask. Shh, you'll unnerve her. It's Monroe, the nurse who's been training me on how to handle difficult cases, frowns. She takes something off on her clipboard, then turns and smiles at the old woman in the wheelchair. Apple crumbles on the menu tonight. I know it's your favorite. Mrs. Bethlehem makes no response. Margaret Bethlehem is Birchwood's oldest resident and rumored to be the most clinically insane. Though 95, she's as hot-tempered as a teenager. I've been told it takes special treatment and sometimes a straitjacket to stop her from banging her head against the wall or to restrain her from biting. Seeing her now, sitting here as placid as stone, I can't imagine it. She may look like death, but she's still got all her teeth, Nurse Monroe says in a low voice, so Mrs. Bethlehem won't hear. They're her weapon, her defense against what she believes are foreign invaders trying to get inside her. 
She once bit off a nurse's forefinger when the nurse tried to feed her mushy peas. So, let that be a warning to you. She'll rip into your neck if she's given the chance. You're a wild one, isn't that right, Margaret? Mrs. Bethlehem doesn't answer, but stares through us as though we're invisible. She thinks we're all evil black-eyed children wanting to possess her. Tess, another nurse working the woman's ward, tells me during our break, Half a century here and she still believes that. Makes you wonder about all the pills we're feeding them. At least it keeps them quiet for a while. Black-eyed children? That's a bit... creepy. I say, hoping she'll tell me more. I don't dare ask Nurse Monroe. She forbids us from discussing their delusions, says these walls have ears, and gossip only encourages neurosis. Tess smirks. This whole place is creepy, don't you know? The halls are crawling with ghosts. I look around, intrigued. Ghosts? What's she trying to say? Does she think the hospital is haunted? I stare at the bleak, gray wall in front of me, waiting, as though it might respond. Nothing. No phantom whispering in my ear. No cold drafts. No white orbs hovering in the shadows. Funny, I don't feel scared. If anything, I feel a sense of peace and tranquility. Ghosts or no ghosts, I'm convinced I can do good here. Listen, this place will drive you mad if you don't take care. Tess turns and disappears down a long corridor. Corridor after corridor. A maze, a communal hive that must be protected. Inmates, now called patients, are here for psychotic disturbance. Paranoia, schizophrenia, mania, melancholy. I've heard strange stories, but their delusions are just that, delusions. Mrs. Brock insists the CIA are after her because she knows who shot JFK. She believes Birchwood is a government prison and the food is filled with truth-telling drugs. Mrs. Roth hears voices that tell her to cut herself and pull out her hair. And Catherine Walsh believes someone is trying to control her brain through the TV. But Mrs. Bethlehem? Her history and delusions are just plain spooky. Later, when I find Tess in the break room, I convince her to tell me more. She was dressed as a witch that Halloween. The doctor's wife and the daughter of a wealthy farmer, she lived a pampered life in a Queen Anne mansion on Warm Springs Avenue. At one end of the avenue was the old penitentiary, at the other, the town's old cemetery. The house, like something out of a gothic ghost story, was just the kind of place that invited stories about dark family secrets and hauntings, murders, suicides. Neighborhood kids dared each other to go knock on the door and run away. Their scavenger hunts always included an item from the property. A stone, a leaf, a blade of grass. On Halloween, the dares grew more vicious. They'd egg bomb the windows, spray paint murder mansion on the lawn. But that Halloween, Margaret Bethlehem had her own trick. Instead of candy... She gave them cow's eyes collected from her father's slaughterhouse. The kids, as you can imagine, were not pleased. So in the middle of the night, two children appeared at her door asking to be let in. A trick to spook her. Night after night, they came to her door dressed all in black demanding she let them in. She claimed their eyes were all pupil. Black as space, full of darkness. Thing is, no one else, not her husband nor her maid, saw him. It's said they watched, gobsmacked as she shouted at the air. No one was there. She suddenly became insane? 
Tess shrugs. We prefer to use the term mentally disturbed. Remember, we must never let them hear that word, especially around Nurse Monroe. Besides, they don't need to know. Most of them think they're in a country club. It's better they believe that. I've been assigned to clean Mrs. Bethlehem's room. She's apparently less disturbed when we only enter to clean. Treatments and injections enrage her. While insulin and electric shock treatments would shatter her bones, she's the ideal patient for drug therapy. With the recent breakthroughs in antipsychotic drugs, she can be pacified. Still, she puts up one hell of a fight when it's time to take her meds. Luckily, I'm not allowed to administer Mrs. Bethlehem any drugs until I've been properly trained. Do you know? Budworm girdle trees while laying their eggs on the underside of needles. Mrs. Bethlehem says as I change the bedding. They'll feed on the ends of needles, causing the tree to die after repeated infestations, especially if attacked by the larvae. The larvae are the most destructive. I glance around the room, cautious. Is there anything besides her teeth that she could use as a weapon? A razor under the mattress? How long are her nails? But Mrs. Bethlehem doesn't look like she could kill anything. Not even a bug. She's weak and defenseless sitting slumped over in her chair. Looking at her, I can imagine she must have been attractive in her youth. Now everything's brittle and gray. Sunken. I didn't know that, I say. You young people don't know very much, do you? A laugh of relief escapes me. <laughs> you could be right about that. I don't even know what a budworm is. She stares at me as if contemplating whether to trust me or not. It's a caterpillar. Well, see, I know now. I have you to thank for it. Hmm. She remains quiet as I finish tidying the room, though I know she's watching, on guard in case I try to give her an injection. When I finish, I gaze out the barred window. The sky is a cloudless blue. The apricot trees are in bloom, and the magpies have made their presence known, squawking for food. It'll be summer in no time. What a beautiful day! Maybe you'd like to go outside and get some fresh air? Shocked by my suggestion, she takes a sudden sharp breath and holds it for a moment. I wonder when she went outside last. They couldn't have kept her inside all these years, could they? She doesn't answer, but asks, I've never seen you before. You're new, aren't you? You're very observant, Mrs. Bethlehem. Yes, this is my first week. I'm Nurse Anderson, but you can call me Clorinda. Clorinda? She stares at me, astonished. She's confused again. Yes, that's right. But how can that... What happened to the other girl? Who? The other nurse, the tall one, the blonde. I don't know. I know, she says. Her hands tremble like something's under the skin, twitching to get out. After a week of cleaning Mrs. Bethlehem's room, I'm promoted to giving her baths and meals. She doesn't object to the baths, but mealtimes are a struggle. Like Ms. Brock, she believes we put drugs in the food to alter her thinking. Or, as she says, make her brain dead. Even though I tell her there are no drugs in the food and that she needs her nutrients, she's still suspicious. I'm trying to spoon feed her mashed up meatloaf and potatoes when she says, I'll eat if you promise to take me outside. According to Nurse Monroe, Mrs. Bethlehem hasn't gone outside the woman's ward for years on account of her panic attacks. Just leaving her room causes fits. The only places she ever goes are to the dining hall or to the baths for water therapy. Even then, safeguards have to be taken so she won't harm herself or others. Last time she went to the dining hall, she thought the rice was full of worms trying to get inside her. She caused absolute chaos. Chaos! Now we can't have that, can we? When Nurse Monroe isn't around, the other nurses get a kick of talking about the patient's illnesses. Honestly, I'm disgusted disgusted by how they speak about Mrs. Bethlehem. Like they're all desperate for her to die. Like she's a burden and a waste of breathing space. The truth is, I enjoy my time with her. 
In some ways, she reminds me of my mother. My gentle, kind mother who was my closest friend before dementia ate away her brain. As difficult as it was watching her lose herself, it made me want to become a nurse and help those who are on the edge of this life and the next. But doesn't she have any family who visit? I ask some of the nurses as we have our lunch in the staff room. Nah, not unless you count her black-eyed children who keep coming round, says a boisterous nurse named Penelope. Black-eyed children? I've heard about them, I say. If the children come knocking at your door and ask to enter, you must never invite them in or they'll devour your soul. Penelope laughs. laughs. So the old crone Bethlehem told you, eh? No, Tess told me. Tess? Penelope's eyes widen. The room is so silent I can hear the fluorescent light above us buzzing. Muffled cries echo down the corridor. Yes, Tess. She told me the story. The nurses exchange sideway glances. Oh, honey. Penelope bites her lower lip before continuing. Tess isn't here anymore. You've taken over her position. You, you must mean someone else. I don't understand. I'm sure I spoke to a nurse who said she was Tess. A tall woman with blonde hair. Forty-something? You must be seeing a ghost, darling. Tess passed away weeks ago. I promised I'd be responsible for any problems that might occur if I took Mrs. Bethlehem out for a stroll around the grounds. She walks at a snail's pace, and she'd be in her wheelchair anyway, so what could happen? In my opinion, nothing outweighs the positive effects of fresh air and physical exercise for sound health. This proves to be true for Mrs. Bethlehem. She blossoms. Her gray becomes a stunning silver, and during her bath, I notice she's gaining color. Nurse Monroe remains emotionless about Mrs. Bethlehem's improved state. No pleasure, no gratitude. In fact, starting next week, she wants me to work with another patient. She'll be taking care of Mrs. Bethlehem for a while. I get the feeling she's jealous or doesn't believe the old woman's peace of mind will last long. It doesn't. I wonder if Mrs. Bethlehem senses I'll be leaving because on my last day with her, she has a relapse. I'm giving her a bath when she becomes agitated and asks if I've seen the children. The children? No, I haven't seen them. If you do, don't let them in. They'll ask and ask, but you mustn't let them in. Okay, I won't let them in. I promise. And she's calm again. I sponge off gray flakes of skin. My senses may be deceiving me, but the new skin looks pink and feels soft as silk. The other nurses are exchanging stories about the patients again. Jessica Thompson believes Joan of Arc is sending her messages in her coffee. Mrs. Roth was found eating her own feces. Maddie McBride thinks she's the Virgin Mary. When I blurt out, I wonder why she sees black children. As if I'd asked the forbidden, they all hush. Penelope finally breaks the silence. Don't you know? I only know she's a patient here because she sees children with black eyes. The nurses stare at me, unblinking, like they're trying to figure out if I've lost my marbles and believe in these black-eyed children. After what I'd said about talking with the dead nurse Tess, they probably think I've got a screw loose. She thinks she's talking to her dead children. Penelope whispers just loud enough so we can all hear. I, I didn't know she had children. They're dead? She nods. They're buried in the cemetery down the road from her mansion. She's the one who killed them. Drowned them in the bathtub. She said they weren't right. Said they wanted to possess her. I'm speechless. Why hadn't anyone told me? She thinks they're still alive and believes they're coming back to take her with them. She's raving mad. 
Penelope goes on to tell me the idea of black-eyed children is not something invented by Mrs. Bethlehem. Apparently, it's a kind of legend, like vampires and werewolves. Stories have been told around the world of these children showing up at doorsteps, demanding to be let in. Legend says that once you hear about these children, there's a greater chance they'll appear. They'll come knocking at your door, and they'll enter if you invite them in. And what happens if you let them in? Don't know. But Mrs. Bethlehem claimed her children were evil, otherworldly creatures. Then she murdered them. My God! People actually believe these kids come into their houses asking to be let in? Yeah, but you know they're all crazy. Too many crazy people in this world, if you ask me. But look on the bright side. We'll never have to worry about not having work. The next day, I'm assigned to take care of 58-year-old Shirley Duncan. Mrs. Duncan is in for manic spells. Most of the time, she keeps to herself, doe-like and mumbling. However, if she has an episode, she'll self-harm by throwing herself repeatedly on the floor or into walls. When that happens, she's immediately taken to the treatment room and given 15 to 20 minutes of electric shock. Sometimes she ends up with broken bones, but we don't know if that's from the ECT or from her falls. After the treatment, she's calm again and no longer a threat to herself. I find her in the common room, docile, sitting in her own piss. I get her cleaned up and brush her hair, which she seems to enjoy. For her age, she has lovely hair though we have to keep it short since she once tried to strangle herself with it. I wonder if Mrs. Duncan has ever seen black-eyed children, but I don't dare ask. Once you hear about these children, there's a greater chance they'll appear. I don't want to put any ideas into her already unsteady mind. She looks up at me and smiles. You're one of the good ones. Aren't all the doctors and nurses good here? I ask jokingly. She quickly looks around the room, making sure no one is listening. Her voice quivers as she whispers, Some of them are monsters. There are no such things as monsters, Mrs. Duncan. Even if there were, I promise you, there are none here. They all start good, but they change. You won't change, will you? Of course not, Mrs. Duncan. I'm here to help you because they become budworms. Pardon me? I ask, not sure I've heard correctly. Budworms. What about budworms? The larvae are the most dangerous. As the days, then weeks pass, Mrs. Duncan and I grow closer. Sometimes she hallucinates and mistakes me for her daughter. It's not recommended to become too attached to patients, but... At Birchwood, we believe by gaining trust, the quality of their lives can significantly improve. So I don't correct her when she calls me Miriam. Although a bond is growing between the two of us, I haven't forgotten Mrs. Bethlehem. Unfortunately, she's confined to her room again, so I can't see her as I would have liked. When I finally do get to see her, It's only because she's having a psychotic episode and Nurse Monroe calls for me to help. In a straitjacket, Mrs. Bethlehem hisses and screams, No! You can't come in! Go away! She believes she's talking to her dead children. She thinks Nurse Monroe is one of them. I'm stunned when Nurse Monroe uses the story to try and sedate her. We are here to help you. If you don't let us in, how can we help you? You're not my daughter! Mrs. Bethlehem scratches the air. I'm not exactly certain if it's me she wants to attack or something only she can see. Hold her arms down and do not let go, Nurse Monroe commands. I do as I'm told and hold tightly onto Mrs. Bethlehem's fragile wrist. She's surprisingly stronger than I would have ever imagined. The savage strength of a trapped animal fighting for its life. You're making this much more difficult than it needs to be, Nurse Monroe says, then leans in and whispers in the old woman's ear. Seconds after the injection, the old woman is smiling. Clorinda. 
her voice floats wind like across the room. Oh, you're back. Where have you been? In the morning, I ask about Mrs. Bethlehem and Nurse Monroe smiles. After years of resisting, Margaret has finally succumbed. Her voice is monotone, robotic almost. The disturbance that plagued her mind is now gone. Gone? How? What does that mean? She's in peace. We know the cure. We have the cure. If only they would stop fighting it. We are here to help them. I don't understand what she means by saying she's in peace. Or we have the cure. Is Mrs. Betham dead? Or is she miraculously cured? May I see her? Nurse Anderson, we have a purpose here. You have a purpose here. There's something about you they trust. How good you are at bringing them to their senses. You can be assured Mrs. Betham is fine. You need to help Mrs. Duncan now. I am here to help, I tell myself as I search for Shirley. I find her in the common room, knitting what looks like a baby blanket. When she sees me, she smiles and waves for me to come sit on the bench beside her. What a lovely blanket, I say. Who's it for? Why, it's for you, she says. For my beautiful baby girl. Looking at me, her smile suddenly fades. Daughter, what's happened to you? The terror in her eyes is so similar to Mrs. Bethlehem's. I worry she may be on the verge of an attack. Nothing's happened to me. It's me. I'm the same as ever. No. She shakes her head back and forth, back and forth. You're different. You're not my baby girl. You've changed. I haven't changed, but you have. She trembles and gasps. It's your eyes. What happened to your eyes? I take a deep breath and smile. Mother, it's me, Miriam. I'm here to help you. If only you let me in. My voice becomes insistent. We are here to help. Come now. Let us in. I hope you enjoyed Let Us In, as written by Tasha Johnson and voiced by Evil Idol 2020 contestant number eight, Shayna Waring. Thank you for joining us. Don't forget, the final two performances from tonight's program were featured in this year's 2020 Evil Idol Horror Voice Acting Competition, which is being hosted on our official Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel as we speak, and which will be running over the course of the next few months. If you enjoyed the performances today, visit our YouTube channel today and cast your vote on the entries for tonight's featured contestants, as well as the other entries in the competition. Again, you can find Chilling Tales for Dark Nights in the Evil Idol competition on YouTube. Just search Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube on any search engine, or visit ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and click the Evil Idol link on the navigation to see a current roster, contestant profiles, and links to all of the performances thus far. As always, we and the candidates appreciate your support. Also, as a reminder, don't forget to take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and leave Chilling Tales for Dark Nights a five-star review and a kind word. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram if you haven't already. And of course, subscribe to us on YouTube, where you can find an archive of our work going back to 2012. And consider signing up as a patron at our website, ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com, to show your support and get all of our content ad-free. I'm your host, Steve Taylor. And it's been a pleasure. Tune in again next week when we once again turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Sweet dreams, listener. Sweet dreams. Thanks for joining us. You've been listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, a production of Chilling Entertainment and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcasts Network. 
Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted by yours truly, Steve Taylor. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Luke Hodgkinson and Jesse Cornett. Sound design and final mixing and mastering by executive producer and director Craig Groshek. Logo by Craig Groshek. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like performed? We take submissions. Email it to us today at submissions at chillingtalesfordarknights.com to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of this show. If you enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave us a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to us. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and other programs and my channel. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon for CTFDN as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew each and every week. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word or a request. And don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories including those you've heard on this program. We'll be back next week with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. But that's all right. Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs>